Okay, well, I suppose we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we're a little past time and uh, participation is a bit lacking, but it is eight o'clock and, well, I, I don't quite blame people. All right, so uh, let's talk about the, uh, the final exam. So I have a spring 2020 final exam topics list. So let's just go through this. So the final exam, is going to be uh, very similar to the, the past exams. It's primarily going to cover what we've done since the second exam. Uh, so the chapter on valuation, the chapter on options, the chapter on mutual funds, and the chapter on futures and swaps. Uh, so that's going to cover about 80% of the material. Uh, the remainder of the material is going to be from the old material. And I realize there's a lot of material that we covered this semester. So uh, before, when I say old material, what I'm really focused on are the most important concepts from the old material. So uh, as you can see, we've got a number of different topics that we discussed in the older material. So things like, can you use CAPM? Uh, can you interpret bids and asks and the bid ask spread? What are the basic asset classes? Can you calculate a return? What is a dividend? All things that absolutely you should know uh, by the end of this class. So, uh, so those I would consider to be fair game on the exam. Uh, now in terms of the exam itself, uh, it'll be very similar to the second exam that we had. So uh, via the web browser, the lockdown browser, uh, you will be allowed to uh, use a, uh, whatever the, the formula sheet that we have and our formula sheet, uh, if you haven't seen it already, is at the bottom of our final exam review. Uh, so notice here, I've got a couple of new formulas. So we've got our standard Black-Scholes here, we've got our, uh, call profit, put profit, and then our uh, futures trading formulas here. All right, so that's that. We're having a review today. We'll have a review on Thursday as well from eight to whenever uh, the questions stop coming in. And then you'll have from Monday to Friday to take the final exam. So feel free to take it whenever you like. and. Uh, I should have the grades up pretty quickly. I, my goal here is to have final grades done by Saturday because I have to submit them to the registrar's office by, I believe, Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, so my goal in trying to get you your final grades as soon as the, the final exam is, window has closed is to make sure that I've not messed anything up. So I'll put your final grade on Canvas and then we'll have about, oh, 48 hours before I actually submit those grades to the registrar. So you see something that is a blank in the grade sheet. Maybe I misgraded something or you submitted something that didn't get uh, you didn't get credit for. Review your grades. Uh, and if you do have any problems, please let me know. All right, so with that being said, I suppose I'll open it up to questions if there are any questions. No questions. <laughs> All right then. All right, well, uh, if you do have questions as I'm going along, please feel free to ask, but why don't I just run through the material and uh, we'll just go through it like that. All right, so on the, we'll start with the older material. And with the older material, I wanted to focus on absolutely the most important concepts. If you see a question on the stuff that we did for, chapter, for chapters one through seven or nine, uh, it's gonna be the big concepts. I'm not gonna ask you some, uh, incredibly detailed question about, you know, when does the 
CAPM not work for international stocks? It, my goal here is to hit you with the big questions, the questions that you should absolutely know by this point. So from the chapter one material, who are the market participants? Well, we have individual investors, also known as households. We have institutional investors, and those are banks, mutual, fund, mutual funds, uh, investment banks, uh, insurance companies, basically any investor, any organization that pools resources and then invests those resources in various stocks, bonds, other asset classes. Uh, we also have a number of other market participants. The two other big ones are governments, which uh, are doing their best to raise capital from institutional and individual investors and uh, firms. So firms are also seeking capital from institutional and individual investors. So those are really the four big market participants, individual investors, institutional investors, governments, and firms. Next, the asset classes. So we, we have a couple of these. We've talked about most of them in this class. Uh, if you've taken Professor Mung's uh, financial markets class, you probably talked about the rest. Uh, you might have noticed that I really didn't cover bonds at all in our class. The reason for that is because he's covering it in his class. So we have a couple of big asset classes, stocks or equity, uh, the money market, which is the short term market. So the money market is essentially the market for any asset that has a maturity of one year or less. So T-bills, uh, oh, uh, money market mutual funds, uh, oh, commercial paper, uh, all of these things mature in less than 365 days. CDs or certificates of deposit are also in that, that money market. Uh, so stocks, money market, uh, the long-term bond market is another asset class. Uh, it's a bigger asset class in terms of total uh, cash than the equity market, actually. Uh, we also have options, uh, futures, uh, and then we have alternative investments, which is something that you'll cover in Professor Liu's uh, capstone course. All right, in chapter two, how do you short a stock? Well, it's essentially a two-part trade. So let's talk about why you would want to short a stock first. So the reason you would want to short a stock would be because you believe the value of that stock will decrease in the future. So think about what's happened in the marketplace in the last two months. We've seen the quickest sell-off of stocks in U.S. history. Uh, we've seen, uh, I mean, you, the S&P 500 fell off by at least 25% uh, from its high in February. Uh, so let's say you knew that was coming. You knew that COVID-19 was a serious threat to the U.S. economy and you want to profit from the value of those stocks on, in the U.S. economy decreasing. Well, first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to your broker. You're going to tell your broker, I want to borrow your shares. Uh, so if you are actually clicking through on your brokerage account, you're going to typically see something in E-Trade that says uh, short stock. Uh, basically telling your broker, I want to borrow shares that you own, and then I'm going to sell them immediately. So that's step one. Borrow shares from your broker, sell them on the open market immediately, and get cash. Now, you can do whatever you want with that cash. You could invest it in another stock, but eventually you're going to have to close that position and return those shares of stock to your broker. So if you shorted, let's say, oh, how about Carnival Cruise Line stock on March 1st, you would want to close that position when you think the share price is sufficiently low. So on April 5th, you would go out on the open market, buy up however many shares that you, that you shorted, and, when you, uh, and then return those shares to your broker. Now, on a brokerage platform, typically you'll see a, a button that says uh, close out short trade or uh, cover short trade. 
Uh, so that's typically what you click and then you'll automatically be buying the exact number of shares that you need to return to your broker. Now, the way you profit on this is by uh, shorting at a high price and buying back at a low price because that difference is your profit per share minus any dividends that were paid on that stock. All right, next, bids, asks, and the bid ask spread. Uh, so let me go ahead and Why don't I share my screen? Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this in the real world. So, so bids, asks, and the bid ask spread. Ooh, portfolio is going to suffer today. All right, let's take a look at. Uh, stock, Apple. All right, so our bid is the number of shares that someone is trying to buy. Uh, so right now, if we're looking at Apple, 271.63 is the highest price, the highest limit price that someone has submitted. This represents a limit buy order. Uh, Typically, when you're buying shares of stock, like you probably saw with, uh, with StockTrack, you can submit a limit order and tell your broker how much you would be willing to pay up to to buy shares. So this is currently the, the limit buy order with the highest price. So someone's willing to pay 271.63 to buy 1,000 shares. Ask prices are the prices that people or individuals or institutions that are selling their shares are willing to sell those shares at. And the lowest asking price is what's being quoted right here. So 272.99 and whoever owns these shares is trying to sell 900 of them. Now notice here that there's a pretty sizable gap between the highest bid price and the lowest ask price. Uh, these are both open orders. In other words, no one has sold their shares for 271.63 yet, and nobody has uh, bought their sh these 900 shares of 272.99. If I wanted to buy shares of Apple right now, immediately, let's say using a market order, I would need to pay 272.99, and then I could buy up to 900 shares. Uh, once I buy those shares, this is no longer the lowest asking price. There's probably another asking price that's slightly higher. All right, uh, now the bid ask spread, that's just the difference between the asking price, the lowest asking price, and the highest bid price. So whatever that difference is, uh, let's say it's uh, $1.36. Well, in that case, that tells us the width of that difference, that spread, that tells us how far apart buyers and sellers are from a, on a particular uh, stock. So the wider that spread is, the less liquid the market for that stock is. Now, if you look again after the market's open, what you'll see is that these bids and asks will narrow. So right now they're, like I said, $1.63 apart. When the market's open, there's gonna be more uh, market participants, more investors submitting bids to either buy or sell stock and that, sh that spread will shrink during market hours. Uh, right now we're in the pre-market period, but uh, after the market as well, we'll see that spread widen. All right, and as a side note, I know I've said this a couple times, uh, the bid ask spread is our best measure of market illiquidity uh, or, and liquidity. So. The higher the spread, the more if illiquid the market for a stock is. All right, chapter four, how do you calculate a return or a holding period return? Uh, hopefully this is extremely remedial, but let's say we have a uh, stock and its price at the beginning of a period is $1.00. 
120 and its price at the end of the period is 155. And we'll say it pays a dividend of 150. All right, actually we'll, we'll get rid of that dividend for right now and just focus on the uh, return. So our return formula is just the difference between the price at the end and the price at the beginning, all divided by the price at the beginning. So 155, or the quantity of 155 minus 120, divided by our starting price, 120. Uh, so here, I'll put this in percentage terms. The, return on this stock over this period from time period zero to time period one is 29.17%. Now, if we had a dividend during the period, we could calculate a holding period return, which involves us including this dividend. So our holding period return formula is very similar to our, our basic return formula, except that we're adding our dividend up at in the numerator. So it's going to be, again, the price at the end minus the price at the beginning plus the dividend. We'll close our parentheses and divide by the price at the beginning. And now notice that our return is slightly higher because we're factoring in the dividend, which was $1.50 per share. Okay. Next, chapter five. Uh, why is the CAPM so important and how can we use it to predict expected returns? Okay, so the CAPM is important for a number of different reasons, but primarily because it's, it's our fundamental model for predicting stocks because it, it, it relies on the fact that there is only one type of risk that should be priced, market risk. Uh, so if you remember when we talked about the uh, portfolio theory and I talked about individual or firm specific risk and market risk, and I showed you and I, I gave you the Chipotle example where Chipotle could have an E. coli outbreak and that would harm only Chipotle. That's an example of firm specific risk. This COVID-19 stuff uh, that's going on right now, this is the perfect example of market risk. I'll be using COVID-19 as my perfect example for market risk for years to come because it affects every stock in the market. Uh, so the CAPM relies on the amount of market risk a stock faces and uses that to predict their stock returns. Now, our primary measure for market risk is the beta. And if you remember in chapter five, we actually calculated the beta directly uh, using simple linear regression in Excel. All right, so the cap M says that the higher the beta, the higher the market risk of a stock, the more or the higher the return investors should demand for that stock. So if we have a stock that, let's say in the case of Apple, has a beta of 1.17, that's pretty close to the market average. Remember, uh, the beta on the S&P 500, which is our primary measure of the market, is one. So here, Apple is just slightly less risky or slightly more risky than the, the market as a whole. So how do we use the cap M? Well, we use it by identifying our beta. We'll say 1.17 and a risk-free rate that's usually going to be some treasury security. So let's say right now the yield on the uh, 10 year T note 
is it's very small. It's probably only like 50 basis points. Uh, and then we'll say the market risk premium. I've heard some analysts saying that it's probably only about three to 4% right now. I don't know how accurate that is. I haven't done my own homework on this, but we'll say that uh, market risk premium is, uh, we'll say 4%. Now, this market risk premium, I know I've said it in class when I first covered CAPM, and I'll say it again. Uh, don't make this very simple mistake. The market risk premium is the difference between the return on the market, aka the return or expected return on the S&P 500, and the yield on the risk-free asset. So that would be this thing. So the market risk premium, what I'm trying to get at is this 4% tells us that the S&P 500, or rather I should put uh, expected return on the market. This market risk premium of 4% tells us that the S&P 500 is expected to have a return of 4% beyond the risk-free rate. So the total expected return on the market uh, for the S&P 500 next year is 4.5%. Now, we have everything we need to be able to use the, uh, the uh, uh, cap bet. So, all we need to do is just take our risk-free rate and add to that quantity of our beta times our market risk premium. And according to the CAPM, our expected return on Apple is 5.18%. Right, there's a bunch of other things I could say about the CAPM, uh, but suffice it to say, there are a lot of other more accurate models or models that predict returns more accurately, but the CAPM is really our foundational model. It's our starting model. It's uh, the original. We have two factor models, three factor models. There's five factor models out there right now. There's uh, 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 Eugene Fama and Ken French actually put out a, a new five factor model a couple of years ago that's kind of becoming uh, the most popular model in uh, academia right now. But uh, its its very first factor is the uh, the market risk factor, which is what we're using with the CAPM. All right, uh, chapter six, what is a dividend and what factors influence the dividend? All right, so dividend, just a, a payout by a firm in terms of cash or extra shares of stock to the shareholders. And we have a couple of factors that influence the dividend. Uh, so first things first, uh, cash flow. All right, so if a firm has very positive cash flow, it's more likely to pay a dividend. It's got a lot of cash on hand. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, if you have a lot of cash flow, it's very likely that your, your cash flow is going to exceed the number of uh, positive MPV projects that you can invest in. Another factor is just cash on hand. And if you have more cash on hand, let's say like, uh, like Apple or Google, in that case, you've got a lot of cash sitting on your balance sheet, you need to do something with it. And what a lot of companies will do is they'll start to try and return that cash to the shareholders. Uh, usually, if they don't believe they're going to be able to generate 
more cash. They'll probably, rather than paying a dividend, they'll, they'll repurchase shares of stock, uh, but we'll, we'll just leave this the way it is. Next, uh, investment opportunities, or rather growth. All right. If a firm has really good growth prospects, why would it pay out cash that it has on hand? It would normally, I mean, from a CEO's perspective, it would be more fiscally responsible to use that cash on hand to invest in those new investment opportunities. So in this case, if a firm has really good growth prospects, it's actually less likely to pay a dividend. So that's that. Uh, those are really the three big ones that I, I think uh, you should know absolutely. Uh, I guess we'll, I'll throw in one more. I guess I did mention this. Uh, uh, cash flow volatility. Now, if a firm has really really volatile cash flows. Uh, what that means is this year you might have cash flow of a billion dollars. Next year, the firm might have cash flow of negative $2 billion. I mean, I think I read this morning that United Airlines was going to have a net loss of at least $2 billion uh, next time it reports its earnings. Uh, if you have really volatile cash flows, it it's far less likely that you as a CEO of a company are going to want to issue a dividend or start or initiate a dividend. And the reason for this is because if you remember what I said when we talked about dividends, the most important thing that a dividend represents is a signal to investors. It's a signal that the firm is going to have good long-term cash flow going forward. If you're a CEO of a company that has really volatile cash flows, why would you ever want to issue a dividend and then be obligated to pay that dividend even when you have negative cash flow in certain quarters? Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is the firms that have really volatile cash flows like tech stocks or uh, cruise ship companies or uh, companies that, uh, you know, have, well, are, are in the travel sector, a, a lot of them. Uh, these are firms that are far less likely to pay a dividend. All right, so there we have four factors that affect whether or not a firm pays a dividend. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that. All right, next, what does a cut in the dividend indicate about a firm's prospects? Well, I just told you or reminded you that dividends are signals. Uh, that is one of the most important things that I can say about dividends. They signal to investors that the firm's cash flow in the future, three years from now, five years from now, is going to be fairly constant. And it's, the firm is going to have enough cash flow to be able to pay out those dividends forever. Uh, the reason for this is because Firms don't like to cut dividends and they don't like to suspend dividends. The reason being that because these dividends are signals, when you cut a dividend, that means that investors are taking away that future cash flow after you cut the dividend is going to be way lower. So whenever we see a dividend being cut or just completely suspended, uh, the fall off in the share price, uh, I mean, I, I have seen academic papers that look at this across the entire economy and on average the the share price decline the one day return is right around like seven percent uh so what i'm trying to get at is when a firm cuts its dividend or even suspends its dividend uh that has a horrible effect on the share price of a stock vice versa when a firm initiates a dividend typically there's a spike in the share price a very positive one day return around the announcement and that's because it's a very positive signal about the growth prospects and the cash flows of the firm. All right, uh, chapter seven, why do investors focus so much on the PE ratio? Well, it's because 
The PE ratio measures the amount that investors are willing to pay per dollar of earnings per share. So let's think about what this, this PE ratio is. It's price per share divided by earnings per share on the income statement. So the price per share is just whatever the, the current share price is. In this case, in Apple's case, it's 276.93 right now. Uh, or it was at close uh, yesterday. Now, earnings per share, that's just earnings per share over the last quarter or the last four quarters. Uh, so if we're talking about the historical or trailing PE ratio, this thing just tells us how much uh, investors would be willing to pay for a dollar of historical earnings per share. So in Apple's case, it has a PE ratio of 21.99. This says that investors are willing to pay about $22 for every dollar of earnings per share that Apple had in earnings per share uh, last year. Uh, now, the higher this number is, the greater that investors are valuing the growth prospects of the company. Uh, so for example, uh, Netflix, my favorite go-to, Uh, it has a P.E. ratio of 105 or 106. The reason investors are willing to pay more for a dollar of earnings per share here is because they anticipate that earnings per share will continue to grow in the future. And eventually, that P.E. ratio will start to come down as the denominator increases. Uh, vice versa, if I were to look up, oh, I'll try this, but I don't know if they have... Yeah, okay, fair enough. So we have GM. Well, GM has a PE ratio of 4.9. Uh, so uh, investors are only willing to pay four or five bucks for every dollar of earnings per share. The reason for this is that uh, GM has, well, very low growth prospects, and there's also the possibility that uh, they, they might actually enter uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy or re uh, uh, corporate restructuring as a result of the uh, the recession that we're going through right now. All right. Next, what are the three forms of market efficiency and which is most likely to be present today? Okay. All right, so uh, three forms. First, we have the uh, weak form. And our weak form of market efficiency says that all past returns, pricing information, and volume, uh, so number of shares traded, in other words. is priced into the stock price of a stock. Uh, so what this says is you can't profit by looking at uh, whether or not a stock had very positive returns over the past six months. Uh, in other words, there's, there's no predictive ability coming from the, retur the past returns of a stock, the past price of a stock, or the number of shares traded uh, with respect to that stock. The next form of market efficiency we have is the semi-strong form. And this says that all public, if I can spell correctly, any public information about a stock is already priced into the share price of the stock. Uh, so think about uh, GM. Well, if you look at GM's share price over the past six months, you'll see it's taken a pretty sizable hit. Uh, one might argue that people are pricing in the possibility of GM uh, being forced to default on its bond obligations and entering bankruptcy. Uh, there's a lot of public information about GM out there right now, uh, but uh, probably a, a more 
simple example would be, let's say a company announces its earnings per share. As soon as that company announces its earnings per share to the public as a whole, uh, that information is going to be taken into, consider by, uh, into consideration by investors like you and me. We're gonna put that in our discounted cash flows models, and we're going to value that stock based on that new information, and we're going to probably buy or sell shares until that stock is appropriately valued. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at here is that under the semi-strong form of market efficiency, any public information has already been taken into account in the share price of the stock automatically. The final form is the uh, strong form of market efficiency. And the strong form of market efficiency says all non-public, private information, I should say, So if Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, knows something about Apple, as soon as Tim Cook knows it, even though the rest of the world doesn't know it, that information will theoretically be priced into the share price of the stock. Uh, if there's a technician working for Apple that realizes there's a huge flaw in the design of the next iPhone, as soon as that technician knows it, that information will, according to the strong form of market efficiency, be priced into the price of the stock. Now, looking at these three forms, uh, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of papers on uh, the forms of market efficiency and which ones are more likely. Actually, it's, I'd say it's probably in excess of thousands. We're probably in tens of thousands of different academic articles on this. But uh, in the US, we usually say that uh, the semi-strong form of market efficiency is the, the most realistic right now. And the way we know that is because when new information is added to the market or becomes public, let's say there's a, a dividend cut or a company announces that it's suspending its dividend to the public, the share price of that stock falls immediately as soon as that information becomes public. So that fall in the share price is representative of that dividend cut information being priced into the share price of the stock. So in the US, we typically say this one is the most likely. Uh, outside of the US, in emerging markets, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, there is actually some evidence that the weak form of market efficiency uh, might hold. In other words, you can actually profit by just using the past returns of a stock. Uh, in other words, past returns might actually predict future returns of the stock in certain uh, lesser developed markets. All right, so that is the old material. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> no questions, fair enough. All right, uh, so with the new material, uh, let's talk about the stuff. Uh, what is the goal of stock valuation for an investor? Well, the primary goal is to identify whether a stock is undervalued or overvalued. Now, if a stock is undervalued, in other words, uh, we're, we're using stock valuation techniques to calculate the intrinsic price per share. We find that that intrinsic price per share is much higher than the current market price per share, we would want to buy shares of that stock normally because that stock is undervalued. Now, if we find the reverse, let's say our intrinsic value per share that we calculate is below the current market price, we would want to consider at least shorting that stock. In other words, betting the share price of that stock will uh, decline until it gets to pretty close to the intrinsic value. All right. Next, what determines the intrinsic value of a stock? Well, there are a couple of factors. Uh, essentially, if we have perfect information, uh, the intrinsic value of the stock is just nothing more than the value of its expected future discounted cash flows. In other words, uh, 
the free cash flows that are going to occur every year in the future discounted at some discount rate, either the weighted average cost of capital or the uh, market capitalization rate, aka the expected return based on the CAPM, uh, back to the present. All right, so there are a couple of factors that go into that model. First, we have the cash flows that are expected to be generated by the firm. So a firm like Apple, it's gonna have pretty positive cash flows in the future. Uh, so we wanna be able to estimate those cash flows. That's uh, the first factor that determines the intrinsic value. The second is the discount rate. And uh, depending on the, the model that we're using to calculate our intrinsic value, we have two different discount rates. It's either going to be the market capitalization rate, which is the rate that we calculate using the CAPM, or the weighted average cost of capital, which is that rate that you calculated in Finance 300. Uh, and I guess we, we did go through that in class at least once. All right, so those two rates are going to be used, or one of those two is going to be used to calculate the intrinsic value. Now, the third factor that determines the intrinsic value uh, is going to be the volatility of the cash flow. So if we have a stock that's incredibly volatile, chances are that extra volatility is gonna show up in the, the discount rate of, uh, of the firm. All right, so that's that. Next, can you use the market multiples approach to calculate the intrinsic price per share of stock? All right, sure, let's give it a shot. So actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. Rather than using an example I have in our review or our past problems, why don't I go ahead and just do a real world example? So for this, what I'll do is I will value uh, Apple's price per share using as its direct competitor, Google. So. So I'm gonna use real world data for this. And so first, let's go get Apple's earnings per share. Uh, so we have Apple and then I'll go over to their EPS. So 12.6. Uh, copy and paste operation. Google's trailing PE ratio is 12.6. Right? So Apple's intrinsic price per share, which is calculated by multiplying some statistic from our target company. Uh, so in other words, uh, we're trying to value Apple. So we need some statistics, some earnings per share number or some cash flow number or some book price per share number from Apple. We're going to take that and we're gonna multiply it by Google's trailing PE ratio or some uh, realistically, what we need is just some multiple of a direct competitor that has whatever uh, we have from our target company in the denominator. So here we have Google's PE ratio. Uh, we need earnings per share for our, for our target company. And in this case, we have Apple's earnings per share. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 12.6, multiply it by this 25.65, and the intrinsic price per share of Apple based on Google's PE ratio, or 
uh, or rather, uh, this number right here, this represents the growth prospects of Google. So we're essentially taking Apple's profitability and copying onto it Google's uh, growth prospects. Since these two firms are similar, or they should be, I mean, we're, we're choosing Google because it is very similar to Apple. Uh, essentially, they should have the same growth prospect. So if we take Google's growth prospect, prospects, copy them onto Apple, that'll get us an intrinsic price per share. Uh, and in this case, 323.19, which is higher than Apple's current price per share, which is uh, about 276.93, or rather in the pre-market, it's 275.22. So in other words, uh, if, we're, if we have this and we're comparing uh, Apple's intrinsic value to its current market price, and we were very certain about this number, this would be a case where we would want to buy shares of Apple. So uh, obviously we, we wanna use more than just one market multiple or uh, one technique, but you know, in this case, we did find that Apple might actually be slightly undervalued. All right. Next, uh, what are the pros and cons of the market multiples approach? Okay, so the big con or rather the big knock against market multiples is that you need to have a perfect or pretty damn close to perfect competitor for your target firm. You need to have some firm that is close enough to the target firm, the firm that you're trying to value, uh, that their growth prospects are going to be similar to the, those of the firm that you're trying to value. In the case of Apple, we have Google. In the case of, oh, Ford, we might say we have GM. Uh, in the case of Coke, we have Pepsi. But there's a lot of industries out there where there's not a good growth, uh, a good uh, direct competitor. So for example, I gave that bonus project and uh, asked people to value Tesla. Well, Unfortunately, the market multiples approach, it doesn't really work that well with Tesla because what firm is a perfect direct competitor to Tesla? I would argue there probably isn't one. I mean, what other firm produces only luxury electric vehicles? I mean, BMW produces, I think, a couple of electric vehicles and it's a luxury car company, but it also produces gas-powered vehicles. Uh, so the, the problem here is that there's not always going to be a perfect direct competitor to whatever firm that you're, you're uh, trying to value, which means that market multiples sometimes breaks down. Now you can always try and use some combination of firms, like uh, two or three different firms who, when you take them together, are an approximation of your target firm, but uh, unfortunately, that's, that's getting a little in the weeds. All right, so that's the first big drawback to market multiples. Uh, the second one is that for some of your multiples, uh, they can get way off. Uh, so for example, if you remember when we went through and we valued Macy's, there were a couple of cases where we actually weren't able to get an intrinsic value because one of Macy's direct competitors, I think it was maybe J.C. Penney, they had a uh, non-existent PE ratio. In other words, the firm had uh, run a net loss in the previous year. Uh, the reason a firm doesn't report its PE ratio when it's a publicly traded company is because its earnings per share are negative. And in that case, you never report the, the trailing PE ratio. <clears throat> All right, so that's issue number two. Uh, I suppose those are really the, the two big issues uh, with, with market multiples. All right. Next, uh, what are the percent of sales and the line item approaches? Uh, what are the drawbacks of each? Okay, so 
Oh, uh, let me jump back to the market multiples approach. Uh, what are the pros of the market multiples approach? I didn't talk about that. The big pro of market multiples is that you can use it when you don't have a good estimate of future free cash flows of a stock. So in the case of tech stocks, the market multiples approach is much more advantageous because tech stocks or stocks of IPO companies, companies that are, as we say, de novo companies, very new, uh, their cash flows are probably going to be extremely volatile and their cash flow growth rates are probably going to be pretty high and it's going to be hard to accurately estimate. So in that case, it's better to find a, a direct competitor in the tech space that uh, likely has the same growth prospects and compare our target firm to that comparable firm. So that's the big benefit. It, it does an okay job if the uh, discounted cash flows methods uh, are not available at the time. All right, on the discounted cash flows side, uh, we started talking about two approaches to the discounted cash flows method, uh, namely the percentage of sales approach and the line item approach. And the percent of sales approach means that when we're forecasting future cash flows, what we're doing is we're assuming that the growth rate of sales will be a certain percentage each year. And then all the line items below sales, so cost of goods sold, uh, net operating profit, uh, all of those things are going to increase at the same rate as percentage of sales. Now this method is advantageous to us because it allows us to, on, it only requires us to estimate the sales growth rate of a company and then we can estimate all of the uh, different line items below that that we need to estimate our free cash flows. Uh, it's a simplistic approach. Uh, the line item approach is the other approach and this is the approach where we, we individually estimate each line item for each year. So sales, cost of goods sold, operating profit, uh, CapEx, uh, you name it for year T plus one, AKA next year. And then we do that for the next year and the next year and the next year. The line item approach is much more time consuming because you don't just have to estimate the, the sales growth rate. You also, you also have to estimate the growth rate of every other line item in, uh, in your valuation. And I gotta be honest with you, I, I try to avoid that approach if at all possible. All right. Uh, Next, can you calculate the intrinsic value using the perpetuity formula? Okay. So, uh, what is the perpetuity formula? Well, perpetuity formula says that our price of an asset, or rather, you might think of this as the stock price or the intrinsic price, uh, the price of an asset is equal to uh, the dividends divided by the discount rate. So when do we use this thing? Well, there's only a few cases where we ever wanna use this formula. This formula is appropriate when there is no growth rate in the dividends per share. Uh, there's not too many cases where we do get to use this thing. The one place that we do get to use it is when we're valuing a uh, preferred stock. Uh, so when we're valuing a preferred stock, the value of that preferred stock, or rather the dividend on that preferred stock is always the same. It'll be, oh, we'll say a certain dollar of value or a certain, uh, well, we'll say a certain dollar value. Let's say $2 per share every quarter. Well, because that dividend isn't changing, the way we calculate the price of a preferred stock is simply by dividing that 
$2 per share dividend by whatever discount rate we have. Uh, so it might be 5% right now. Uh, usually we're gonna calculate this using the cap M if possible. So if let's say, uh, Uh, just, uh, let's say that our dividend per share is $2 per share and our discount rate is 5%. Our price is going to be equal to 2 divided by 0 0.05 and it's going to be $40, uh, just two divided by 5%, and uh, that'll be the price of that preferred stock. Okay, pretty basic. Next, can you use the dividend discount model to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock? Okay, let's do a more complicated example. So, So you have a certain amount of information here. We know that uh, you're trying to value a stock that has a dividend or just paid a dividend of 145 per share. Uh, keep in note, uh, at the back of your mind, I said just paid. Market cap rate is 8.55% and the dividend growth rate is 2.5%. What should the price of this stock be? All right. So. Here. Let's look at the dividend discount model. Dividend discount model, or uh, as it's also known, the Gordon growth model, says that the price of stock is equal to the uh, dividend right now, or D0, times 1 plus the growth rate of the stock all divided by the discount rate, which in this case is our market capitalization rate, minus our growth rate. Now, we know in this example that our D0, or dividend that we just paid, is 1.45. It's the dividend right now. Uh, Next, we know our market cap rate of 8.55%. That's our discount rate, 8.55%. And our growth rate is just the growth rate of the dividend, so 2.5%. So all we have to do is just plug this information into our equation. So There we go, looks pretty good. And so our price per share should be about $24.57. So that's one example of the dividend discount or Gordon growth model. Uh, now, occasionally, uh, if you take the CFA exam or uh, say the second or FM actuarial exam, what they like to do is uh, flip this around and rather than using just paid a dividend, uh, 
I might say something like, will pay a dividend of $1.56 or $1.56 per share uh, next year. So in this case, actually, let me just bring all this stuff down. In this case, you've got a dividend next year of 1.56 per share. What this tells us is that all of this uh, is equal to 1.56 because it's the dividend today plus one or times one plus the growth rate. So uh, our next year's dividend uh, is just today's dividend times one plus the growth rate, the annual growth rate. So D1 divided by R minus G. And so in this case, it's just 1.56. And again, we'll just solve for the price. And in this case, it's not much different, but it is different. Uh, so $25.79 per share. So uh, that's an example of the dividend discount model. All right. Now, uh, what are the pros and cons of the dividend discount models? Well, to answer that, I'll go back to our main dividend discount model formula, which is right here. Notice here that in the denominator, denominator we have the discount rate minus the growth rate. Uh, the first big issue with this is that if this growth, if I'll put the pros and cons up here. So we'll start with the big uh, drawback first. Uh, uh, the growth rate, G, can't be greater than the discount rate. Uh, the reason for that is that, let's say, in this example, our, our G is greater than 8.55%. And let's say we change our, our sorry, discount rate is 8.55% and our growth rate is 2.5%. Let's say now that our growth rate is 10%. Well, that'll make our entire price per share, oh, I should have linked here. That'll make our entire price per share negative. Uh, why? Well, it's because down here in the denominator, we actually have a negative number. It's 8.55% minus 10%. Negative denominator makes this entire thing negative. So I'll just go back to what we had before. All right, so that's number one. Growth rate can't be greater than the discount rate. Uh, second, You can't accurately value a stock that grows at different rates each year. In other words, this formula, it assumes that there's a constant growth rate forever. That growth rate in the dividend will never change. Uh, now, in the real world, this is just not realistic. I mean, no firm is going to grow at the same rate forever. Uh, the closest thing I've ever seen to that, I was looking at a, a graph of China's GDP growth rate for uh, the past, I think, eight years or so. And it, it looks like someone just wrote it in without looking at actual data. It just perfectly slowly decreasing through time from 8% to about 6% year over year over year over year. And now their GDP growth rate is negative 6% uh, annualized this year. 
because of the, the coronavirus issue. Uh, but that in the real world with real data, that doesn't actually happen. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is uh, you can't, this, this model is a little unrealistic uh, outside of some very specific examples. Uh, like using it in conjunction with the uh, two-stage discounted cash flows model. All right, so that's the uh, the big, the other big drawback to this model. Uh, also, if we are using this model, uh, most firms don't actually pay dividends. Uh, so, if you valued Tesla in that bonus project you realized almost immediately, Tesla doesn't pay a dividend. So the question is, how do you use this model to value Tesla? Uh, in that case, uh, you have to use free cash flows, or in this case, free cash flows uh, to the equity. Uh, so this model, it kind of breaks down in most cases because, well, Firms outside of Ford, Apple, the big companies that I've used in examples in this class, a lot of other firms just don't pay dividends. So, big drawback there. Uh, now, the big benefit of this is that it's it's really simple. I mean, it's it's kind of like a back of the envelope formula for us. I mean, if we really want to value a company, maybe not as accurately as we otherwise could, it's something that we can literally just do in in a split second. Uh, it's very, very simple, and it might get us close if we have complete information. So that's, that's the big benefit, and that's why it's used. Uh, that's why it's so common. That's why it's taught in uh, intro classes. All right, so that's that. All right, uh, so with that being said, are there any questions so far? Okay. All right, uh, next, uh, chapter 12 discussed the managed funds. So we talked about a number of managed funds. Uh, so can you tell the difference between each of them? We talked about unit trusts, REITs, open and closed end mutual funds, hedge funds, ETFs. Uh, the goal here is if I give you let's say if i say something like uh, this fund is actively managed versus passively managed and its uh, manager earns two and twenty percent uh, what type of fund am i likely referring to and hopefully you'll tell me a hedge fund because it's actively managed and uh, historically the most common way that hedge fund managers were compensated was two percent annually in terms of assets under management, plus 20% of the profits. Uh, so you should know a little bit about each of these different assets. And uh, for that, I strongly recommend that you revisit both the slides and the lecture video. Uh, so uh, I, I might ask you a couple of questions on, uh, can you tell the difference between these if I give you a couple of characteristics of one of them? All right, next. What differences exist between closed-end mutual funds and open-end mutual funds? All right, so the big difference between open and closed-end mutual funds is that closed-end mutual funds, they only ever sell a certain number of shares of the mutual fund, let's say a million shares. Once those shares are issued at the time that the mutual fund is created, that doesn't change. Those shares are traded just like you would trade a stock on an exchange, but you can buy or sell them at something that is different from the NAV. Uh, so closed end mutual funds, the closed end part means that they're closed to issuing new shares. Op open end mutual funds are mutual funds that you typically buy directly from the, the fund or the, the organization that's issued that, those funds. So let's say I want to buy a Vanguard mutual fund. It's an open-end mutual fund. I would go to Vanguard, buy 100 shares of their mutual fund directly from them, and 
Vanguard would create 100 new shares if they don't have any on hand right now. And they would then go out and purchase additional amounts of all the assets in their portfolio. In other words, they're increasing the amount of their holdings in each of the assets that are currently in their portfolio to account for the fact that they issued new shares in exchange for cash. Uh, so that's the big difference. Open-end mutual funds, they can increase and decrease the number of shares they have outstanding of the fund itself. And closed-end mutual funds, there's a fixed number of shares. Now, there's a lot of other differences between open and closed-end funds. Uh, another big difference here is that, uh, well, let's start off with open-end mutual funds. Uh, so open-end mutual funds, typically the, the price of that fund will be determined at the end of the trading day. Uh, so at the end of the trading day, whatever the NAV, the net asset value is, and that NAV is just the, think of it as the intrinsic value of the fund's uh, assets, uh, just assets minus liabilities divided by shares outstanding of the mutual fund. Whatever that ending, end of the day NAV is, that's the price that you, if you wanna buy shares of that mutual fund, are going to pay for those shares. Now, closed-end mutual funds, uh, let me, just pull up one really quickly. So notice here, I have, oh, that is, I don't know why it went to Coca-Cola, but it did. Okay, so I have here an example of a closed-end mutual fund. So as you can see, it trades throughout the day. I mean, yesterday, you can see that the, the value of the closed-end fund uh, fell throughout the day. Uh, so this is, I mean, one of the big differences. These shares trade, these funds trade almost like stocks during open hours of uh, the, when, the, when the market is open. Now, the other big thing to remember with closed-end funds is that they are often subject to something called the closed-end discount or the closed-end fund discount. And the way that works is kind of like this. And I suck at the graphic arts, so I do apologize. That should say value. <laughs> okay, uh, so if this line represents the, uh, the NAV, or rather, if this line represents the NAV of a uh, uh, fund, let's say it's the almost like the intrinsic value of the uh, fund's portfolio. In other words, this is the, the line or this is the value that the fund share should be trading at. Most closed-end funds will typically trade somewhere below this line. You know, they might break above it occasionally, but uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that if this is time, over time, uh, most closed-end funds shares trade at a discount to NAV. Uh, usually that discount is going to be somewhere between about 10 or 15 percent. Uh, but during crisis periods, uh, maybe like right here where my cursor is, uh, that discount is way bigger. The reason it's a much larger discount is because uh, there's liquidity concerns. The closed-end fund discount is almost entirely related to uh, liquidity concerns. If you are uh, an investor and you're deciding whether or not you want to invest in uh, a closed-end fund, uh, the, one of the things that's going to prevent you from investing in, the, in those shares is whether or not you think you can get your money out in the case of a crisis. Well, in the case of like the 09 crisis where people are trying to sell their shares but no one's buying, they're having to sell for a greater and greater discount 
on the NAV. Uh, so that would be this point right here. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is there is a closed end fund discount. It is fairly large and it's primarily due to illiquidity of those, uh, of those uh, closed end fund shares. Uh, you may not be able to sell them at a price close enough to the NAV in the case of a crisis. So really this is more an uh, illiquidity risk story. All right, next, can you calculate NAV? Okay, well, let's just do a quick example from the uh, review that I posted. So question 12, I'll just copy it over to our Excel. So in this question, a mutual fund owns 200,000 shares of stock A. So, or sorry, 20,000, my bad. I think I said 200,000, that's not right. Uh, and 100,000 shares of stock B. And price per share of uh, $4 per share. And then it has some labor expenses. So these are essentially the costs of running the mutual fund. So uh, $50,000. And then we have uh, 900 shares outstanding. So can we calculate the NAV? Well, yes, of course we can. So our NAV formula is just our at the quantity of our assets minus our liabilities divided by our shares outstanding. And so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take our 20,000 shares of stock A, multiply that by the price of stock A, and add to that the 100,000 shares of stock B times the price of stock B, and then subtract our liabilities, which are just those labor expenses and overhead cap uh, room, and we'll divide by our 900 shares outstanding. So in this case, Our NAV is 500. So if you wanted to buy these shares, and this was an open-end mutual fund, this is the price per share of mutual fund that you would pay, 500. Uh, so that's how it's done. Just assets minus liabilities divided by shares outstanding. All right, next, uh, can you calculate the present value or future value of a mutual fund investment based upon the returns and fees? Well, hopefully. Oh, here we go, number 13, perfect. So, the formula that we're gonna use for this I think I actually have it uh, back here. I don't explicitly name it as the formula for calculating the future value of uh, mutual fund investment, but uh, if you're watching this lecture, uh, here's a hint. It is at the back in the formula sheet, uh, so use this formula. All right, so let's go through problem 13. So you invested some money in a mutual fund 20 years ago. So T is going to be 20. Uh, the average annual return on the mutual fund over the investment period is 7.2%. These in as we go. Uh, so 7.2% is our return. So that's R. Uh, 
the fund charged a front end load of 1.5%. The front end load is this B right here. Uh, it's a one-time expense and you pay it as soon as you invest in a mutual fund based on your assets that you're uh, contributing to, uh, in, uh, to the fund or investing in the fund. So that's that. And our expense ratio of 80 basis points, uh, that is X in this equation. And we're paying it every year. The expense ratio is the amount that you pay based on assets under management that you have at the mutual fund. And that just goes to cover the mutual funds expenses. So 80 basis points. And today your portfolio is 750,000. So in other words, FB is 750,000. And we need that to be number. All right, now, uh, Notice here that I didn't mention the back end load or otherwise known as the redemption. I didn't mention the C. Anytime I don't mention that or anytime you see that in a CFA exam problem, uh, basically that means that C is equal to zero. So you can just kind of forget about it. Uh, now, our goal here is present value. We want to calculate our present value. And to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of this stuff over here, uh, the one minus B through the end of here, and divide FB by that. So what I'm gonna do is just take FB divided by, uh, first off, one minus our front end load times the one plus the return to the power of t. Times one minus our expense ratio to the power of t. And then if we want to, we can just take one minus zero, but you don't really need to. All right, so this will be our formula for calculating the present value or the amount that we initially invested in this mutual fund. And I will convert that to dollar signs. And so 20 years ago, we invested 222,545 dollars ish. And now we have $750,000, so not a bad haul. All right, next, how do ETFs differ from mutual funds? Well, I think I actually had a specific slide dedicated to this, uh, but we'll, we'll go through it. So, First off, mutual funds uh, typically uh, actively managed, or at least they should be. Uh, the reason being that you're, you're paying a higher expense ratio and therefore your manager of your mutual fund should be actively managing that portfolio. Uh, in reality, a lot of mutual funds are not as actively managed as you might think. There's a couple of metrics that you can use to determine this. Uh, but yeah, all right, ETFs, they are passively managed. So because they're passively managed, you don't have an entire team identifying undervalued or overvalued securities. So the benefit there is that it, these have low expense ratios. Uh, compared to mutual funds, uh, typically, mutual funds will have higher expense ratios. 
another characteristic about mutual funds, they typically have, uh, well, I mean, I'm trying to think of, uh, talked about this when I talked about mutual funds versus ETFs, but in the long run, there most of the evidence on mutual funds versus ETFs shows that uh, once you remove the fees, or rather the expense ratios that you're paying to mutual funds, they don't actually outperform ETFs. Uh, so there may be some ability or some benefit to investing in actively managed funds, but most of that benefit is being captured by the fees of these mutual funds. In other words, the people that are managing the mutual fund are, uh, they're earning or taking away any additional benefits that that fund has on top of the ETF. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess those are really the big differences here. Uh, so, yeah, I guess we'll leave off there. All right, next, pros and cons to investing in, in a mutual fund. Uh, so there's a lot of pros to investing in a mutual fund. Obviously, it allows you to diversify. You have very little capital. So if you have $5,000, you might only be able to invest in five different stocks. But you could also invest in a mutual fund that holds stocks of 50 or 100 different companies. So that's a big pro to investing in a mutual fund, and admittedly, an ETF. Uh, also, uh, mutual funds allow you to keep track of your portfolio through time. They'll always send you a, a quarterly report stating what assets are in that portfolio on the reporting date. They also, because they're diversified, you're eliminating most of that firm-specific risk that we talked about in Chapter 5. So most of what you're exposed to is market risk is very good. Uh, one E. coli outbreak at Chipotle is not going to sink the value of your mutual fund. A coronavirus outbreak might do it, but you know, that's, that's, market. <clears throat> that's market risk. All right. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I guess the big con of mutual funds is that they're, they're more expensive than ETFs, and there's not a significant benefit uh, in exchange. There's, there's, not a lot of benefit that comes along with that higher price tag in terms of expense ratio. All right, so that's that. Uh, chapter 14. All right, so chapter 14 involves options. So call options, you should know what those are. Put options, you should know what those are. Call options pay off when the value of the underlying asset goes up above the strike price. Put options are options that pay off when the value of the underlying asset falls below the strike price. And you can exercise it and sell whatever assets you have uh, at a higher price than the market price. All right, now profit and payoff of call options and put options. Uh, in the back of our review, you'll see a couple formulas here. Our call profit and put profit are here. So P minus K minus the premium. P is the price of the underlying asset. So let's say we have uh, calls on uh, stock. So we have uh, just basic stock options and the price of the underlying stock goes up. Well, the higher that goes, the more profit we're going to generate from this call option. K is our strike price. That's set when the option is created. Uh, in other words, uh, it, it's fixed. So as long as P is greater than K, we would want to exercise this call option. Lastly, we have the premium. And the premium is essentially the price of the option. It's the price you pay for the right, but not the responsibility to exercise this call option. Uh, it's, you pay this up front, and no matter what, you've lost that value of the premium. That's that. Uh, put profit is exactly the opposite. Uh, it's going to be 
strike price, so the price that you can sell the underlying asset for, minus the current market price for that asset, minus the premium. So I think I gave you the example of uh, puts on bushels of corn in our lecture. So if uh, you've got puts on bushels of corn that you're producing as a corn farmer and the price of corn falls, well, you can exercise those puts and sell those bushels of corn for your strike price as opposed to the market price per share. So in other words, you're selling bushels of corn for a higher price than they're currently worth on the market. Step three problem. All right. Uh, next, what are American, European, and in the money options? Okay, so American options are options that you can exercise at any time up to the expiration date. So if you've purchased options that have an expiration date one month from now, well, if they're American options, you can exercise them tomorrow, a week from now, all the way up to one month from now. European options, on the other hand, are options that only allow you to exercise them on the expiration date. So again, if you have that, you've purchased a European option on some currency, you only get to exercise that option on the expiration date one month from now. Uh, typically, stock options are American options, and there are some European currency options. Uh, but most options in the U.S. are going to be uh, American options. Mm -hmm. Next, in the money, out of the money, and at the money. Uh, this in the money just refers to the fact that if you were to exercise this option, you would earn a, a positive payoff. Out of the money means that if you were to exercise the option, and if it's a call option, buy the underlying security, uh, you would be out, out, out of the money. You, you wouldn't earn a positive payoff. And then at the money means that if you were to exercise the option, the payoff would be zero. All right, next, Black Scholes. All right, so Black Scholes is how we calculate the price of a, a sorry, a European uh, call option and a European put option. So Black-Scholes is an option pricing formula that I put in that spreadsheet and it essentially calculates the price of a call option with a set strike price and time to maturity. So it takes five different variables to be able to price that European call option. The underlying stock price, the strike price of the option, the implied volatility of the underlying stock that you specify, uh, time to maturity, and then the interest rate or the one-year T-bill yield. Uh, so you take all five of those factors and you use it to calculate the, the value of a European call option. And then you can use the put-call parity formula to calculate the value of a corresponding European put option with the same strike price. All right, next, types of options. Uh, Actually, I'm not entirely sure what I was going for when I put that. So why don't we just skip that? There we go. All right, put call parity. Now, put call parity is something that's pretty straightforward. It's this formula. Put call parity says that the value of a stock should be equal to the synthetic stock that is created by buying a call, selling a put, and buying a bond with a face value of whatever your strike price is. In a perfect world where there's no arbitrage, where you can't make money without risk, this formula should be true. So if we, can, if we look up the price of call options and put options and uh, the interest rate, that this uh, and the present value of a bond with a strike price of K, and this entire thing on the right hand side is different from the left hand side of this equation. We have potentially an arbitrage opportunity uh, because eventually these things will have to be equal to one another uh, when these 
call and put options and the bond mature. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is you can use, you should be able to theoretically use any three of these four uh, pieces here to calculate the four. And so let's say we wanted to calculate the price of a stock. All we'd have to do is look up the price of a corresponding European call option, or in this case, uh, American call option, price of a uh, put on that stock with the st same strike price of K, and then whatever the, the strike price is, we discount that, that face value or that strike price to the present at uh, the, the whatever the risk-free rate is. And that should get us to the stock price or the, the price of the stock as of right now. All right. Next, how do we trade options? Well, we trade options, I mean, pretty much the same way we, we trade stocks. I mean, if I go over to, uh, let's say, Apple, and go over to options. You can see that we have a huge number of options on Apple stock. And right now the current share price of Apple is 272.40. So if I wanted to purchase a call option on Apple stock, I could purchase this one. It has a strike price of 272.50. And the premium or the price I would pay to purchase this option is $7.95, or at least that's the last price paid for that premium. And this option matures on April 24th or expires on April 24th. And unfortunately, there is no implied volatility. Apparently, no one is uh, really buying. Okay, fair enough. All right, so yeah, that's, that's that. If you wanted to buy this option or let's say buy any of these, uh, these other options, what you would do is you'd buy them very similarly to the way you would buy stocks. You'd go over to the options section of your brokerage account, click buy, or uh, maybe you want to sell options uh, and then select the price that you'd be willing to pay to buy this option using a market order or a limit order. and I mean, then you'd be able to buy a certain number of options. Now, options, just like stocks, usually are sold in what are called round lots of 100. Uh, so, I mean, you, you can decrease that depending on your brokerage account, but usually you, you can't buy or sell less than 10 options or options on 10 different stocks or shares of stock at a single time. Now, these options, they trade on many different exchanges. So shares or this option on Apple stock, it probably is going to trade on at least three or four different exchanges like the, uh, uh, the NASDAQ options exchange, the CME, uh, just a huge number of exchanges. All right. Next, what is the purpose of buying and selling options? Well, the big benefit of buying and selling options is that it allows you to hedge against risk. So I gave you a couple of examples in the PowerPoints and video lecture. Uh, so uh, go ahead and take a look at those. I mean, the two that I mentioned were the benefits of buying put options if you're a, a corn farmer, and then uh, buying barrels of oil if you are the CEO of an airline. So I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but price of a barrel of oil literally fell to a negative value yesterday, which you might not think is possible, but there are storage costs for oil. So if you have too much supply, you might need to pay someone to take those barrels of oil off your hands. So uh, yeah, literally the price of a barrel of oil fell to, I think maybe it was like negative $30 or something ridiculous like that yesterday. Uh, but yeah, so it, it can happen. Uh, but uh, if you're the CEO of an airline, now would be about the time to start buying uh, options on barrels of oil to hedge against the, an increase in the price of oil in the future and thus 
the price of jet fuel in the future. So in other words, uh, options are frequently used to hedge against uh, an increase in input costs. And then they're all also often used to uh, by speculators to make a lot of money. So I myself have uh, made a series of options trades in the last year or two, uh, just before Sears went bust. I did make a significant number of put option trades on Sears. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really short Sears or you couldn't before it went bankrupt because it uh, everyone else was already shorting Sears. But yeah, so uh, in the past I've, I've liked to trade options, but I don't do it that frequently. All right, next. Futures. All right, so how do futures work? What is the purpose of a futures contract? Well, futures are used to essentially hedge against risk. Uh, again, they're like options. Uh, so first off, you're, you're locking in the price that you as the long position on the contract will pay. Uh, so you enter into a futures agreement and at the uh, specified time, you will pay a certain amount for a certain good. So a uh, futures contract like that, uh, that oil futures contract that I mentioned a few seconds ago where it was negative. Uh, in that case, the long position would actually uh, get paid money. So maybe that's a confusing example to use, but in most uh, time periods, in normal time periods, you enter into, two parties enter into a futures agreement. So there's a short position, the person or the investor that is uh, selling the futures contract, and the long position, the person or investor who's buying that contract. So let's say I wanted to uh, buy, enter into a futures agreement that allows me to pay $8 per bushel of corn in the future, let's say six months from now. I enter into that agreement today and then Six months from now, I pay $8 per bushel of corn and I get that corn. Uh, in some cases, that corn is going to be delivered directly to a certain location, like somewhere in the city of Chicago, and it's my job to transport that corn. Or sometimes uh, this is just a cash arrangement and I agree to pay $8 and then whatever the current spot price of that corn is, I get the difference between that and $8. All right, what are the differences between futures and options? I think I specifically put a, a slide or two in the chapter 15 material, uh, but the big difference here is that options come with the premium up front, so you're paying a price immediately if you're uh, purchasing options, whereas futures contracts, like in that example I just gave, you don't pay anything up front. You pay a certain amount when that futures contract expires or matures, uh, but you pay nothing up front. Uh, options, uh, you have that, that premium up front. All right, what factors are considered when writing a futures contract on a commodity? Uh, again, I gave you a, a list of them. I mean, uh, there's a huge number of conditions that are gonna be relevant there. Uh, so uh, interest rates, uh, supply and demand for said commodity, uh, weather, if we're talking about orange juice uh, futures, like if you've ever seen the movie Trading, uh, trading uh, Places, uh, weather is a big concern in uh, the pricing of commodities. So that's, yeah. all right. So can you calculate the forward price of a currency or other assets? All right. So there's two formulas here that you'll need to be aware of or be able to use on the exam for this chapter 15 material, and they are right here. So this is just our basic uh, futures uh, formula or our forward rate formula. And it says that the spot price or the price of an asset today times the uh, uh, e to the power of whatever our discount rate is, so R, so uh, risk-free rate times time to maturity is going to be equal to our forward rate or futures rate. 
Uh, so if we have, let's say a, oh, let's say the value of corn in price per bushel today is $7, we would put in $7 and take that, multiply that by e to the power of uh, whatever our discount rate is, whatever our risk-free rate is, let's say it's 50 basis points times time to maturity, it might be six months, and then all of that would give us our forward rate, the price that that corn is going to be worth, let's say six months from now. All right, next we have this formula. And this is our formula for calculating the uh, futures rate on currency. So it's essentially the same formula uh, with one exception. Uh, here we, we have the spot rate on the currency or the price of the currency today. So currency X buys a certain number of currency Y. And let's say this is euros. So let's say our, our spot rate for uh, euros per dollar is, we'll say our spot rate of dollars per euro is 1.08. Uh, so every dollar, every euro buys $1.08. Uh, so that's, we would put in that spot rate right there and we'd multiply that by one plus the risk-free rate in, uh, in this case, it would buy, uh, it, we would put in the risk-free rate in the European Union. Uh, so probably the, the risk-free rate on German bunds. Uh, so let's say that's say 20 basis points right now. We take that to the power of T, which is the amount of time over which we're investing. And then we're dividing that by one plus the risk-free rate in country Y, in this case, the US. Uh, so uh, that might be the, the yield on the, the six month T bill. Uh, so one plus that rate to the power of T, T might be six months and then this taken together will give us the, uh, the futures rate on uh, dollars per euro. So in other words, uh, uh, one euro if in the immediate period, it currently buys $1.08 or $1.08. Uh, in the future, one euro might buy $1.10. So this is how we actually calculate the uh, the value of, or rather the, the future exchange rates or predict future exchange rates. Uh, we just use the interest rates of the two, of the two corresponding countries. <clears throat> All right. Now, why are futures important? Uh, I mean, quite frankly, they allow us to hedge risk. I mean, they allow us to speculate and make money as well, but futures give us important tools for hedging against risk, particularly if we're the producer of some good. Uh, so that's the big, big uh, reason why futures are important. All right, how does the futures market work? Uh, I did actually put in our video, I walked through uh, the futures market, so the CME, I think. Uh, so go take a look at that, and I actually walked through that, that video. All right, well, I, I guess that is that. And we do have the formulas for the exam on our last copy these formulas over. I will update our spring or our formula sheet as soon as we get done with this video. But uh, with that being said, hopefully there are still some people left out there. Uh, are there any questions? I did kind of ramble on. But on the plus side, uh, on Thursday, all we have to do is just go through and I'll, I'll answer any questions that anyone has. So Thursday should be pretty short as far as a review session goes. So, okay, well, if there's no questions, I suppose I'll end the video here. And if you do have any questions later on, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, or reach out in any other way. And with that, I'll conclude. So thanks for stopping by.